Are we ready? Panel? Okay. Um, people are slowly meandering back from lunch, but we're going to go ahead. They'll just miss the stellar introduction of this panel. Um, so our next, our next subject um, on the taxpayer rights spectrum is confidentiality and privacy. And you know we had the preceding panel about transparency, so now we're sort of saying, okay, how do we deal with the additional rights to confidentiality and privacy within an age of transparency? So I'm going to turn this over to Carol. Kinsey in Washington. Um, I, I am a former IRS uh, tax executive, uh, have worked in policy as well, and so I, I, I was very happy to support this, uh, this initiative on behalf of US EFA. Uh, we have a, an incredible panel here today, just flown in from all over Europe and, and, and Australia uh, to, uh, to engage in a dialogue about this. Uh, we've agreed to keep the individual presentation short so that, so that we can have some panel discussion and uh, if you'd like, take questions from the audience. So I'll just uh, introduce people very quickly and frame the issue and then we'll be off and running. Um, to my right is, is Professor Graham Cooper uh, from Sydney. Uh, he's a professor of uh, tax law at the University of Sydney and also works as a consultant with uh, a, a leading uh, uh, Australian law firm on the side. He's got experience with the OECD advising uh, through IMF, the World Bank, uh, et cetera, as well. Um, so uh, is, uh, is, has the benefit of having a lot of practical experience as well as, uh, as, well as uh, um, a, a, an independent academic view. Um, to, my, to my left is Joachim Nergelius. Did I say that right? Yeah. yeah who is a professor at the School of Law, Psychology, and Social Work, an interesting combination, <laughs> at Örebro in Sweden. And uh, he is going to uh, share with us a, a particular Swedish perspective on some of these issues. Um, sitting next to Joachim is Philip Baker, uh, a QC from London. Uh, he uh, um, has... Uh, I think developed an international reputation on taxpayer rights, has been working on this already uh, through uh, IFA and, and uh, other initiatives, uh, and is an expert in both taxation law and human rights law. And so we thought that, uh, that Philip would be, uh, would be an excellent addition. He's currently a visiting professor in international tax at Oxford. And those of you who work in international tax will know his treatises as well, I think, in his many writings. Um, we're going to uh, talk about uh, privacy, confidentiality, whatever you want to call it, uh, from a taxpayer's pers perspective, and whether that is necessarily in tension with, uh, with the current uh, transparency initiatives. I was happy to hear my old friend Bob, Bob Goulder on the last panel say that he thought that they, that they were not. Uh, inconsistent, and that one could uh, uh, pay attention to and give due regard to taxpayer privacy and confidentiality uh, while, uh, while still uh, maintaining a transparent uh, tax system. And maybe we'll take a vote at the end of the panel and see what others think. <laughs> We're going to start uh, by having Professor Cooper uh, frame the issues for us. He, he's a uh, um, uh, looked uh, through a very broad lens at current trends and issues. And then moving from the more general to the more specific, uh, Professor Baker uh, will share a European, a pan-European perspective on this because there, there, there are many very specific uh, rules in Europe that, uh, that, that a lot of us are not familiar with uh, yet. Uh, and so that will be a good introduction. And then Professor Negelius will tell us about how this has worked in practice, a concrete example uh, from Swedish law and, and what lessons that, that gives us. And then we're going to, uh, told the panel they have to, to answer some questions that I've, uh, uh, that I've drawn up and, and, and other questions that the audience might have so that we can get into the uh, nitty gritty of this. So Graham, we'll turn it over to you 
Thank you very much, Carol. Um, yes, and thank you very much to the organisers uh, to, uh, for the invitation to, to be here. Could I get the first slide somewhere? Could I? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, as Carol said, my, uh, my take on this really began when I was being uh, asked by uh, some clients uh, to try to outline the developments that were occurring uh, in Australia, uh, and that was relatively easy to catalogue. What was not quite so easy to catalogue was, was the trends occurring toward uh, the kind of broader dissemination of information that was occurring worldwide. Uh, and so I thought it was sensible to try to take a rather longer term view about the way uh, the world of privacy as we used to know it is fast becoming a kind of 19th century construct. Uh, Mr. Snowden probably told us a little bit about that anyway, and now tax officials are getting on the bandwagon. Um, there's apparently uh, a lot to be, to be uh, thought about in this space, so I've called my, my short presentation The Challenge to Privacy, Projects to Capture and, and Disseminate Taxpayer Information. Uh, I, I, the other title I was playing with was uh, Be Afraid, Be Very Afraid. Um, uh, but I guessed that maybe this audience was going to be predominantly academics uh, and uh, tax officials and uh, they would, uh, they would uh, perhaps not view things in quite the way that I would. Um, the way I, I tried to construct this was kind of uh, Salome's Dance of the Seven Veils. Uh, and so, um, I've, or Dante's Circles of Hell, I'm not sure <laughs> which way you want to view this, um, but it is... Thank you very much. That makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, okay, and so, so what I, I thought really the way to, to think about this was in terms of the, the increasing capture and dissemination of information. Uh, so I, I started here really with just a whole bunch of, a whole litany of things that are being undertaken nationally in domestic law and the impetus for those things in domestic law uh, that relate to the collection of increasing information uh, to be provided primarily to national regulatory authorities, but increasing levels of information about the entity's own activities, about the ownership of entities, uh, about the transactions that the entity is undertaking with associates and the activities of its clients using the, the, the uh, information gathering power, not for the purposes of anything to do with the person who's doing the collection. And so, on, oh, on this list I've just put, uh, put together a bit of a shopping list. So if you think about some of the areas where governments have said, we want to know more, governments have said, we want to know more about your uncertain or your aggressive tax positions. So think about FIN 48 in the United States, uh, uncertainty uh, it has to be reported in your financial accounts. Well, if you're doing that for the auditors, why don't you tell us as well? We're the tax guys, we'd like you to send us a bit of paper. Australia, of course, loves to ape things that happen in the United States, so we said, we'll do that too. So we have a thing called the reportable tax position. That kind of gets captured uh, in things like BEPS Action 13. Uh, BEPS Action 13, uh, sorry, BEPS Action 12 uh, is about uh, highlighting aggressive and uncertain tax positions. So the world has looked at uh, America and said, yeah, we'll have a little bit of that. Uh, increased data matching, I've just referred there to a measure that was happening in Australia. Uh, but one of the things that we decided to do is to try to get reported in real time to the tax office every credit or debit card transaction occurring in the Australian banking system. Uh -huh. Be afraid, be very afraid. Uh, data collection about financial accounts, you will of course be familiar with these, but really I like to start this stuff with the AMLCTF legislation uh, because uh, that kind of was the first attempt for, uh, for regulators to say we actually need to collect much more data about who is behind financial accounts. Uh, I understand that when FATCA was proposed, there was this naive perception that actually it was all being done anyway for AMLCTF purposes, and so, so it was not going to be too big an ask. Uh, common reporting standard, uh, there's some EU stuff here that Philip can articulate much better than I can. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting is the emphasis on trying to get access to information about ownership of entities, complete information about the ownership of entities. Many countries will have fulsome uh, registers for uh, artificially, uh, artificial entities in the form of corporations. Uh, limited partnerships, trusts and so on will often be much less formally visible in the economy. And so the G8 and the G20 are getting excited about, about that as well. 
global uh, reporting, country by country reporting and so on. All of that information is being produced nationally, provided nationally. My second circle of hell, or the, the next veil, uh -huh. my regulators now say, well, let's talk to other regulators around the world. So now we have new arrangements for local tax authorities to exchange information, typically in an attempt to get that done automatically, which means we've got to have a standard format. Uh, and that information is going to be provided uh, to uh, the tax authorities of other countries. Uh, the, I put at the bottom of this slide, uh, we're also going to get tax authorities of other countries to tell us not only the information that they collect about their taxpayers, but information about what on earth they are doing. Because governments have kind of worked out that they have two enemies. Uh, one enemy is the taxpayer, the other enemy is the country sitting next to you. Uh -huh. And so, so uh, if you think about, about uh, BEPS Action 5, uh, that is really all about an attempt to prevent uh, the, uh, the charlatans of the tax world uh, from giving um, amusing rulings uh, to people which have very little, very little um, technical merit to them. So now the information that was given to my state is being shared with other states. Uh -huh. And we'll see the mechanisms by which that is being done articulated in things like tax information exchange agreements. They are just so 90s, I can't believe it. But once upon a time, they were, they were the de rigueur. If you didn't have 40 or 50 tax information exchange agreements, you weren't really a sensible country. The OECD multilateral convention. The TRACE project. TRACE was an attempt to try to get... Uh, came out of the collective investments vehicle work at OECD, but an attempt to get real-time information for the purposes of... Uh, people who've got investments in collective investment vehicles to get that information made more, more popular. The automated, standardised, mandatory, multilateral reporting projects. So again, here we get G8 declarations, FATCA, common reporting standard, the EU Council directives, and then backing that up with uh, international instruments like the OECD uh, competent authority agreement and so on, and then uh, the work in BEPS Action 5 and the EU equivalent in the tax transparency package. I think I'm doing okay, aren't yep. I? Yeah, thank you. Whatever you're nodding, I'm comfortable. When you start <laughs> shaking your head, I'm not comfortable. Okay, so my third circle, the, the, the last veil, really, is when the information that has been produced domestically uh, and perhaps shared internationally is now made, but still within the confines of, of the tax administrators, or tax and regulatory administrators, now becomes visible to the whole world. Yep. And that, uh, of course, is being done, being driven by a whole bunch of uh, uh, political imperatives, but uh, also with um, uh, some uh, view that this is good for the polity. So uh, I've just listed here uh, new requirements on entities to make their own tax information available to the public. Requirements. Mm -hmm. And then uh, entities picking up the ball and saying, well, if, if this information is going to be made public, we will articulate we will try to, to give a better expression about what that information shows. Uh, I've put there public inquiries and revelations, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and then informal public revelations about, about tax information. So here, the kinds of things I had in mind were things like uh, IT, the Extractive Industries Tax Initiative, which was an industry-based initiative uh, by and by resources companies to say, in effect, we're sick of being blamed for maternal health in country X. Uh -huh. We are sick of being blamed for uh, literacy levels in country Y. We pay an enormous amount of money in various contributions to government X and government Y, and here is our evidence about that. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, has happened much more recently is that com companies have decided, I think, from their own... Uh, from their own uh, PR point of view, uh, that they actually need to pick up these mandatory obligations and, and own them and spin them the way they want to. So uh, uh, I, I took out a little list um, of some of the companies that have now got very fulsome tax disclosures in their annual financial reports. So I've, I've, some of the companies I've just pulled out here are BHP Billiton, Rio Tinto, SAB Miller, Vodafone, all of whom now produce as part of their annual reporting detailed information about their tax compliance in various countries. I'd encourage you, if you haven't looked at the BHP Billiton report, to go and have a look at it. It has got information about 
their taxes, royalties, and other payments. Okay, other payments. And you think, ooh, I wonder what they're putting in there. Well, they're putting in things like contributions to infrastructure projects. I'm not sure that's tax, but they claim it is a contribution to an economy. Dividends that are taken out where the state owns some of the natural resource extracting company. Payments for exploration permits and those kinds of things. BHP billeting document then tries to break down project by project, level of government by level of government, how much they are paying to each of these people. Now, uh, that, that document runs to 50 or 60 pages, but it, to me it's the harbinger of what's going to happen in this space. The corporates will decide that they actually want to, for their own reasons, uh, disclose uh, much greater, to the public much greater levels of information. Uh, running in parallel with that, and perhaps prompting that, is the mandatory public disclosure regimes. So, uh, some of you will know that in my country we are just about to witness uh, the first uh, public disclosures of uh, five pieces of tax information about every uh, large Australian company. Uh, we will be told their name. We will be told their number. We will be told their accounting profit, their tax income and their tax. And those five pieces of information must be published by the Commissioner of Taxation for the year 1314. So it's taken about 18 months to get that, to get that uh, all bedded down. Um, the amusing thing in Australia, of course, is that large portions of the economy, uh, so the entire property sector, uh, is operated through trusts. So any rule that apply, of which are, which are transparent, they're re it's a REIT equivalent regime. Uh, so any regime that requires public disclosure of taxable income and tax paid applied to a REIT is kind of nonsensical. Uh, but uh, So the government is, has asked our Board of Tax to try to come up with a much broader voluntary disclosure regime for, uh, for a broader section of the economy um, that will include trusts. Uh, the last point I've put here is the formal and informal naming and shaming. Starting with the formal naming and shaming, of course, uh, Senator Levin, uh, uh, Margaret Hodge in the UK, uh, in my country, uh, Senator Dastiari, uh, have gone to great pains uh, to reveal to the public in political forums, uh, tax positions of various countries, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, companies, and running in, in tandem with some of that, of course, the, the enthusiasm that the politicians have shown for, for uh, disclosing information is, uh, has been driven by things like the SAB Miller report from Action Aid, uh, Mrs. Birkenfeld and Kaiba. Uh, the LuxLeaks work of the uh, International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, I hope I've got that name right, and so on. But you can see there the informal public dissemination uh, of, of information. Uh, so those are my three circles of hell, and I think it is <laughs> 2.25. That's pretty good, five minutes per circle, okay. <laughs> Well, we'll see. Let's. Um, that, that's an excellent overview, I think, of the uh, of the recent developments, current trends, uh, pressures on both uh, the tax administration, and the taxpayer. Uh, let's turn to Philip and talk about uh, about sort of the basic legal framework and and uh, what the EU has to say about that. Yes. Thanks very much indeed. Now I'll speak from here, if you um, don't mind. Sure. Um, can I also thank um, Nina and her team for the very kind invitation um, to come to this conference and speak today. Um, I'm delighted to be at the first international conference on taxpayers' rights to be held in the United States. Um, I'm going to try and cover two matters in the limited time. I want to focus primarily on the position in Europe under both the Council of Europe and the European Union on privacy and particularly exchange of information and data protection. And I'm also going to take the opportunity, if I may, um, to publicize the EFA report on practical protection of taxpayers' rights. Um, I'll start then with um, exchange of information and data protection. Um, and happily here, um, Graham has um, painted much of the background um, on the um, history of developments um, if you have access to my slides, I'm going to jump over the first, I think, seven or eight slides 
which deal with the different provisions on gathering and exchange of information, um, and, and just summarize that um, we've moved very far and fast from exchange on request to automatic exchange. We have, as Graham's mentioned, um, several non-identical systems um, for exchange, but I'd argue that in that development, very little attention has been given to effective safeguards. And it's the safeguards in Council of Europe and European Union um, that I'd like to focus on. I'm going to start with um, the right to privacy and with the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, just to remind you, um, this is a 1950s convention from the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe <clears throat> is 47 countries. It's broader than the European Union. It covers virtually every country from Ireland in the west to Russia in the east, from Archangel in the north to Larnaca in the south. Um, so a very broad range of countries, <clears throat> all of whom are signatories to the European Convention, and all of whom recognize the right of individual petition to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. So these are legally binding rights, ultimately enforceable through um, a, a claim to the court in Strasbourg. About 15 years ago, um, I did a little survey of um, the cases on tax matters that had gone to Strasbourg, and I think at the time there were about 250 or so cases. Since then, they've been accreting in the rate of about 30 cases a year. So I'd imagine we've now got well over 800 cases that have come from Strasbourg on tax-related matters. One of the key rights that's appeared in a number of tax cases is Article 8, the right to respect for private and family life. Um, everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence. But it's not an absolute right. It's qualified by providing that there should be no, sorry about this, I've got a bit of a tickly cough which I can't seem to throw off. Um, there should be no interference unless it is in accordance with the law, necessary in a democratic society, and in the interests of, amongst other things, economic well-being. So um, the gathering of information for tax purposes will not be a breach of Article 8 if it's in accordance with the law, necessary in a democratic society. Um, don't ask me what a democratic society is. One day I hope to live in one. Um, <laughs> but if it's in the interests of, amongst others, um, economic well-being. Um, there's a parallel right in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. This is just the European Union. <clears throat> this is what would have been the Bill of Rights in the European Union Constitution but we don't yet have a European constitution, so the Bill of Rights became a separate document, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And unlike the European Convention on Human Rights, which is 47 countries, this is EU 28 countries. But generally parallel rights for Europe and for the Council of Europe. Um, we've had cases um, in the tax field um, in this area, just to illustrate from one or two quite early cases. First one, well over 30 years old, um, the case um, X versus Belgium or um, Hardy Spurlock versus Belgium. You might ask me, how comes the case has an anonymous name and a non-anonymous name? Um, the answer is that when cases go to Strasbourg, they can be anonymized. But because they go through national courts first, it doesn't take a lot of research to go back to the Belgian courts and to find out who Mr. X um, really was, which is a question of practical protection of taxpayers' rights. Um, the Belgian authorities were investigating Mr. Hardy Spurlitt's tax affairs. They asked him to produce a statement of his income and expenditure going back a number of years, and he said that breached his right to privacy because it would disclose intimate details of his personal life. I don't know what he was spending his money on, but he didn't want to disclose it. Um, he took his case through the Belgian courts and went on to Strasbourg. The old European Commission on Human Rights, now replaced by the court, said, in principle, 
all gathering of information by a tax authorities for any purpose is an infringement of the right to privacy. But it can be justified if it's in accordance with the law, necessary in a democratic society, and if it's not disproportionate. In this particular case, given the amount of tax involved, they concluded that it was not disproportionate for the Belgian authorities to seek the information. Um, there are references to some other cases on this area. Um, I haven't got time to go through um, all of them. Um, so collection, personal information, amongst other things, has to be proportionate. Um, those are some more recent cases, two on the gathering of information for exchange from the European Court of Human Rights and one from the European Court of Justice of the European Union. So summarizing briefly, all gathering, retention, and exchange of information is primarily, it's pri prima facie, a breach of the right to privacy, but can be justified if it's in accordance with the law, represents a fair balance, and is not disproportionate. And I would say that generally challenges by taxpayers in this area have been unsuccessful there, though it is influencing best practice um, of governments. That's what I wanted to say about um, the right to privacy, and I'll come back to that, if I may, in the discussion um, a little later. Let me turn to the more specific area of data protection, because with the availability of computer power to gather big data, big protections are needed. And in this area, again, Europe has moved forward with data protection. The right to protection of personal data is actually contained in the treaties establishing the European Union. Um, TOFU, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, Article 16, has the right to the protection of personal data, and specific legislation is required by the treaty. For reasons that I have to say I don't know, there's also a provision in the Treaty on the European Union. We have not one, but two treaties <laughs> establishing the European Union. Actually, we've had more than two um, there. Um, and the right to data protection um, is found um, in both. Um, it's also found in the European Charter on Fundamental Rights. Everyone has the right to protection of personal data. Such data must be processed fairly for specified purposes there's a reason why I'm going to go through this um, verbatim, because I want to come back and make some points on it. On the basis of the consent of the person concerned, or some other legitimate basis, everyone has the right of access to data which has been collected concerning him, and the right to have it rectified, and compliance with these rules <coughs> shall be subject to control by an independent authority and every member state of the European Union has a data protection agency established by its government to give effect to um, these rights. In a more concrete form, the provisions of the treaties and the charter um, are given specific legislative form by Directive 9546 on the protection of individuals with regard to the processing of personal data. Just to explain, um, a European directive is adopted at the European level, but must then be implemented by every member state by national legislation. So every member state has a Data Protection Act or its equivalent. And each of those acts has to give effect to the provisions of the directive so member states shall protect fundamental rights of natural persons with respect to privacy in the processing of personal data. Article 11, the data subject, the person about whom the data is being processed, has a right to know if data is being collected, a right to access the data, and a right to rectify it if it's inaccurate. There are limited exceptions for, amongst others, tax reasons, but it has to be a necessary measure. And there's a right to compensation 
for unlawful processing of data, including unlawful processing by governments. So a government that unlawfully processes data for tax purposes could find itself liable to pay compensation to the taxpayer as a result. There are specific provisions dealing with the transfer of data to third countries. Most important, the transfer to a third country. Um, third country in European terms means anywhere outside of the 28 member states, US, Canada, Australia, may only take place if the third country in question ensures an adequate level of protection. So transmitting data to a third state that does not have adequate data protection would be a breach of the directive, breach of the charter, breach of the treaties, and potentially give the government liability to pay compensation. There's actually a methodology for determining whether countries adequately protect data um, under the snappily named Article 29 Data Protection Working Party, set up, not surprisingly, under Article 29 of the directive. And that consists of representatives from each of the member states' data protection agencies. That working party has, not once, not twice, but now three times, warned that the exchange of information under FATCA and under CRS must comply with data protection and warn that there are, at least for the time they wrote, inadequate protection. So you'll see there the WP29 shares concerns expressed by some in relation to compliance with FATCA and the directive. Um, subsequently, they warned about the OECD's common reporting standards, and they considered that they lacked adequate data protection safeguards. And earlier this year, they set out a statement on automatic interstate exchanges of data for tax purposes, <coughs> emphasizing that it must meet, point number one, data protection requirements namely the principles of purpose limitation. That's the principle that you've got to identify the purpose for which the data has been gathered. And you cannot use it for any other purpose. And you can't just say it's for tax purposes. It's got to be much more specific than that. It's called checking the accuracy of returns. And when that purpose has been finished, the data must be destroyed. And the data must only be exchanged under the principle of necessity. There has to be a matter of necessity for the data to be gathered and exchanged. There is a little bit of a salutary warning here for the tax authorities of Europe in the digital rights case. That's a case that was taken a little over a year ago. And the European Court of Justice struck down the legislation that provided that mobile telephone operators should keep records of all the phone calls made for a number of years. That was challenged by a case coming from Ireland, and the European Court said that did not properly protect data protection because it went more than was necessary. The argument of governments was that we need this information in order to combat terrorism. Didn't matter, breached data protection, it was disproportionate. There's also another um, case, I didn't put it on here, but of course, the more recent Schrems case, Maximilian Schrems, um, the student who challenged the exchange of information by Facebook to the United States and was successful in establishing that the European Commission's decision that information could be sent to the US under the safe harbors provisions, that was contrary to European law because the data subject still had the right to challenge individually that the US did not provide adequate protection. I'm not, I think, going to trace the history of the data protection changes 
to the European Directive on Administrative Cooperation, but just to point out that since December last year, our European Directive, which provides for information to go from one country to another, that directive now states that all member states are data controllers for the purposes of data protection, meaning they have to ensure data protection and face potential liability. It also states that any data subject must be informed of the data collection in sufficient time for them to exercise their data protection rights. And finally, information processed in accordance with the Administrative Directive shall be retained no longer than necessary to achieve the purposes of the Directive. And after that, must be destroyed. I'm just going to wind up on data protection and then move briefly on to the IFA report. Data protection is concerned with much more than just confidentiality. It covers notifying the data, data subject, allowing access, identifying the purpose, destroying the data after the purpose is achieved, and controls over transmission of data, particularly to third countries. There's a number of open questions about data protection. I'll just direct your attention to the very last one. What will happen when a country is denied data from Europe because it has inadequate data protection legislation. I'll make two predictions here. I am certain that there will be challenges brought in Europe to the exchange of information under FATCA, EU FATCA, CRS, whatever, um, on the grounds that it breaches data protection. And I'll make a second prediction, which is there's a strong probability that in the case of some countries, those challenges will be successful. And European countries, all 28, will be unable to supply information to the countries concerned. Carol, I think I've overspoken my time, <laughs> haven't I? But do I have a couple of minutes just to talk about the EFA report? Two minutes. Two minutes. That's yeah. all I need. Yeah. That's the EFA report. Um, why did we produce it on the practical protection of taxpayers' rights? Well, we did it partly because the Swiss EFA branch wanted us to do so but also because there is a very strange lacuna in human rights protection with regard to tax. If you work in other fields of human rights, I used to do torture and executions and things like that. Um, uh, um, not personally, uh, happily. Um, you come across standards that have been established mainly by the UN, standards for the conduct of the police, standards for the conduct of medical officials in prisons, standards for conduct of the judiciary, standards for the conduct of prison officers. Where are the standards for the conduct of revenue officials? Standard setting, this process that is fundamental to human rights protection, hasn't even begun in the revenue field. There are reasons, I think, why it hasn't begun to do with the institutions concerned. It should have begun. And the purpose behind that report was to kickstart that process and to try to establish international minimum standards for revenue authorities and best practices. I do strongly urge you to have a look at the report. I'll make certain that the general report is put on the website. Um, just by way of last point um, here, um, we identified minimum standards and best practices, and we then sent out a questionnaire to the national reporters and we gave marks to countries according to whether they had a particular protection or not. And what you've got there are the highest scoring countries um, and the lowest scoring countries. Um, it would be invidious of me to identify where the United States fell um, <laughs> in that particular spectrum. Um, but if you ask me afterwards, I might just possibly divulge it. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Um, let's hear how this, uh, how this uh, plays out when one gets specific at the level of national law. And uh, uh, 
Joachim will t take us through that in the case of Sweden as a case study. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I also wish to thank uh, the organizers, Nina Olsson and the others, very much for uh, inviting me here and, and for, for uh, organizing this excellent conference. I was very, very impressed by the many fascinating presentations that we've heard so far. I'm not sure I can live up to this standard because I'm not a tax lawyer. I don't know so much about tax law, actually. I'm, I'm a constitutional lawyer. Uh, but I may have a few words to say about the issue of transparency as such, uh, dealing a little bit with, with the Swedish regulation, but also perhaps on a European level and, and uh, trying to, to, to discuss a little bit which are the pros and cons of transparency in general, and if you do have transparency in, in general as a general principle, like in Sweden, uh, what's the point perhaps of limiting it within uh, the tax uh, uh, sphere, the taxation sphere? Uh, that's my topic for today. Uh, I, I must also say a little bit about my background here. I be, took part in a project which was administered by my colleague, uh, Eleanor Christofferson, which went on for uh, two or three years uh, on the topic of tax secrecy and tax confidentiality, and generally on the issue of transparency within the tax administration. It was a joint Swedish-Austrian project uh, generating doctoral dissertations and so on, but also actually publishing uh, quite a huge uh, book uh, in two volumes on uh, the transparency within the tax administrations of 37 different countries, including the United States. As far as I know, it's the biggest study so far that has been done on this topic. You may have seen it. It was published in 2013 at the Peter Lang Verlag in, in Frankfurt in Germany. Um, um, and and uh, I actually think it, 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 it goes uh, quite far in, in trying to see how, how this, those things are developing today in, in, in different parts of the world. But that's, that's the, a little bit about my background as a non-tax lawyer being here in, in front of such a distinguished audience. And then I have a few general remarks uh, on the issue of transparency. We've seen a lot now on the European rules in this field, thanks to, to, to Philip Baker, and, and uh, I won't repeat that, but you can say perhaps that in Europe you have a block of nations who are generally governed by transparency within the public administration. And to this group, in this group, I would include the Nordic countries and the Netherlands. I would say those are prominent in this uh, area. But I would also like to stress that in the development within European law, within EU law in particular, those countries have had a great success in the last 15, 20 years. Maybe that's something that we didn't mention, but I would say that the European Union has gradually gotten more transparent within its ad public administration. And you can see certain rules in the, the, Charter of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights as a sign of this, stating, for instance, that the individual has a general right to uh, transparency and to access of documents within the public administration. That's in Article 41, I think, of, of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And, and uh, um, uh, due to various factors, uh, deliberate work on those issues, but also due to the general development in society, I would say that the EU has felt the need to become more transparent. It's not totally transparent, and if, if you compare the EU administration and the national administration in Sweden, I still think that it's, it's much easier to get hold. You, ha you may have the same document, and you cannot get it from the EU institutions in Brussels, but you can get it from the national institutions in Stockholm. That has happened to me at least twice. So, so I mean, there is still a difference, but, but the European Union is moving in this direction, I would say, by and far, despite the fact that, that many of the big European states do not have a tradition of transparency. That goes for Germany, France, and also the United Kingdom with its Official Secrets Act. So, so, so this is kind of a controversial issue today in Europe, but I would say that the transparency promoters are gaining ground gradually. Um, this is important. I would say this has been a profile issue for Sweden, which has perhaps the oldest transparency tradition uh, anywhere in the world, I, I, I would actually assume. It has been written into the Swedish constitution with a few interruptions since 1766. So it's, it's quite a long uh, history, 250 year, years next year. And I would say that when we talk about cultural values and so on, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite strongly anchored actually in the Swedish constitutional and administrative tradition. So, so, so it plays a certain role and, and we could keep that in mind as a point of departure. <coughs> 
Uh, I would also like to stress, which may be useful, I may take this one step further than you did and say, where do we find United States in this respect? Uh, and I'm not an expert on this, but I would say that United States is actually closer to the Nordic countries and to, to Netherlands than to the, some of the continental countries in Europe. That's my general impression. Uh, when I was a civil servant working in the European Union, like 10, 15 years ago, uh, I once had a, a, the task to make a kind of comparative study concerning uh, transparency in certain areas, and the background was that there was something called the Lisbon, Lisbon Strategy. It's not to be confused with the Lisbon Treaty. The Lisbon Treaty contains the two treaties that you were referring to, the Treaty on the European Union and the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. But the Lisbon Strategy was, a, was an attempt to increase European competitiveness in, in the economy in, in very different, through very different measures. And one measure was to try to see whether transparency among the public administration in general, could, uh, ben could be beneficial for, for companies and private enterprises. So I made a small study focusing on various issues, and one that I remember in particular was the access to maps from uh, pub public administration, whatever kind of uh, agencies you have, you know, the, the real estate agencies and so on. And it turned out that in, in the United States, this was not a problem. Any kind of company could have access to any kind of maps which, which discovering, dis describing how a certain city looks like and what a certain part of the country looks like, which may be very beneficial if you want to plan investments and so on. Whereas in Europe, this was a great problem in, in most of the uh, EU member states, in, in a, you know, 10 or 15 of the member states that existed. And it was, you had to pay a lot of money or it was simply impossible to get hold of maps showing uh, uh, the territory and the ge geography. Maybe today that is a smaller problem given uh, the access to Google Maps and so on. But, but anyway, it, it, w it made me think a little bit that, uh, that I think the United States is actually way ahead of many European countries in this respect. And, and maybe th that is true also in the tax uh, administration field. I'm not sure, but it's worth noticing. Now, if we turn back to Sweden for some time, for a short time, uh, you may think then that everything is public since transparency is the main rule. Everything is, 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 is public in the public administration and so on, and, and it's always possible to get hold of any kind of documents that you like. But that is, of course, not true. And uh, I, I, not, I don't think that the Swedish system imper is perfect in any way, but we were handled a couple of questions here that we're going to discuss later on concerning how to measure uh, uh, different interests in terms of transparency, but also respecting, on, on one hand, but also respecting the integrity of individuals, on the other hand. And in a way, I think that the Swedish, the, the new law on uh, transparency and access to documents and secrecy from 2009, which replaced the old law of 1980, at least tries to do this, uh, to achieve this um, uh, measurement, this, this uh, weighing of interests. And uh, it, it works with three different criteria for, for deciding whether or not certain information, certain documents are to be made public or not. And uh, I will not go into details on that, that would be too technical. But what is interesting to note here is that in the tax sector, uh, there is actually quite a lot of secrecy, uh, which in order to explain it in a rather easy way, in a rather simple way, I would say that the whole procedure based on which the tax to be paid from each individual uh, is done is secret, whereas the tax de decision, the annual tax decision, once it is being made, is public. And so that is quite easy for, for everyone who is interested to get a hold of. That may be an individual who wishes to check his neighbor, but it may also be the media who wishes to check, who wish to check certain persons. And, and, uh, um, this, I think this, the, the, we have two uh, important conclusions to draw from this. One is that it is actually possible uh, to make a distinction between uh, interests of the individual to be uh, respected and to be protected in the tax assessment procedure. And here you may, the, the tax authorities do of course have access to all the documents that the individual has provided and, and many information concerning his or her private life which should not be and should never be made public. And on the other hand, the tax decision which shows how much money that person made last year and, and, and how much tax he or she or the company for that matter is going to pay. And that is always public and there, there's no possibility ever, I think, to make that secret. So, so uh, uh, this distinction is possible to make, it works. Uh, and I can also say that 
by and large, I would say, I don't know what, what people from the tax administration would say, but I would say by and large, the whole tax sphere, the whole process of taxation, uh, of, of deciding upon the economy of individuals uh, from this point of view, um, uh, is actually more protected than almost any other um, administrative activity in Sweden. The only thing which I think would compare is in, in criminal cases, the whole procedure before the prosecutor decides whether to, to, to um, uh, bring a person to court or not, uh, to, 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 to um, prosecute or not. Uh, that's, I think maybe you can draw a parallel. That whole process before deciding on what to do and the information that we may be gathered is secret, whereas the decision, once it is made, is public, and that would normally also means that all the information which, upon which that is based is being public. So, so uh, I, I think for, for my, perhaps for future di discussion, this distinction is important, and it, 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 it's po possible to make, and it works by and large. On the other hand, we must talk also about what would be the remedies for the individual if he or she should be somehow harmed through leaks or something else, and uh, um, how does this affect the media then? Well, if we take the media situation first, I think one of the aspects of, of transparency in the Nordic countries and in Sweden is that it's quite beneficial for whistleblowers. There are rules in one of the Swedish constitutional acts protecting the right of civil servants to leak information to the media. But the way that the rules work, uh, this, these rules would very rarely apply to tax civil servants uh, for uh, information that they receive during the taxation process. Uh, you have rules both in the, the one of the constitutional acts, the so-called Freedom of Press Act, and in the new law on, on uh, transparency and secrecy, which if you read them together, show that it is not possible for civil servants in the tax administration to leak information concerning the economy uh, of others uh, to, whom, to, who they, to which they may have uh, classified uh, access. So, so um, uh, it, it's, um, I think, uh, maybe not, if, if you compare with criminal cases, uh, the situation when some celebrity is being caught, suspected for some crime or for some reason, which may be economical, but, but could also be, be related to violence or sexual offenses or whatever. Uh, I think it is more common that you have leaks in criminal cases than you actually have from the tax uh, administration in, in tax uh, cases. Maybe because the criminal cases are more spectacular, you have a greater media interest, I don't know. But, but it's actually quite interesting when you compare this. It may also be because the rules are written in a way which makes it's more difficult, it's, it's more categorical, it, it's clearer that the tax administration cannot leak to the, to the media, uh, uh, whereas maybe police and other persons who are involved in criminal investigations may find some, some, some loopholes, I don't know. Uh, but on, what you have on the other hand is, is something which surprises me because I don't think it would be that interesting, but once the, the tax decisions are made and they are being made public, you have, for a certain kind of the press, uh, the, the evening newspapers, so to speak, as they are normally called, um, an activity which, which uh, I think people should be tired of by now, but, but they, they inform the readers once a week normally, not only on who gains the most, who, who, who gains the most in your neighborhood, but then they show an enormous amount of fantasy and creativity because then they break it down to sections and say, who are the women under 35 who made most money last year? Who improved his or her income most the last year? Uh, which married couple made the last money the last year? And, and so on. And they go on. And I actually fail to understand how this can be interesting for people to read about week after week. <laughs> but, but somehow there, there, there seems to be a market for this. And, and um, uh, uh, this is the kind of what we, we may call intrusion into persons' private lives that we have related to this transparency. Um, I'm not sure if it's something which harms a lot of people enormously much. I, I think basically that it's, it's tedious, it's boring, but, but uh, um, it, it's something that, that exists and which may be seen as, as a kind of, of backsides, backside to this, as a negative side to this, the, the backside of the coin, the flip side of the coin, so to speak. Um, the other thing I would like to mention that in a system like this, which perhaps could be improved, I think you would perhaps need better remedies for individuals who might be harmed. The system is 
created in a way which means that no information should be leaked during the, the tax procedure. Uh, and maybe, and it seems to work reasonably well, maybe that's the reason why the rules on remedies in terms of procedural remedies, in terms of an efficient tort law for persons who feel that they have been harmed somehow, should be a little bit more efficient. Here I would actually say that the European law is much more developed than the Swedish national law. And, and uh, here there is definitely room for, for improvements. I will not go into details on this, but, but whereas I think that the, the basic idea of transparency uh, and access to documents works very well, I think that the exceptions in the area of um, um, tax uh, administration as a whole works well and is, is well th thought actually. I think that there could be room for some improvements in the procedural law area. And then if we are to somehow evaluate, maybe, may evaluate, maybe we come back to that in the panel discussion. I'm not sure if okay. I have a few more minutes or okay. two. two minutes, yes. So, so, so um, uh, which are the advantages, which are the pros and cons of having a great amount of, of transparency in general, but maybe limiting it somehow in the tax sphere? Well, by and large, in the public administration, I think it's clear, I think it's shown by n knowledge since a long time and also regular you know, service being made by Transparency International and, and, and similar organizations, that a huge amount of transparency in the public administration leads to lesser amount of corruption. I think that is particularly true in Sweden, actually, where one single political party held power for a very long time, more than 40 consecutive years, and, and also for a long time after that. And normally this would have led to a huge amount of corruption, which was now not so clear, not so not such a big problem, mainly due to the principle of transparency and the way it is working. I also think that the public administration as such becomes more efficient because it knows that it has the eyes of the media, the attention of the media uh, on it the whole time. It can never relax. It, can, it cannot be allowed to make too big mistakes. Uh, some uh, problems may be related to the integrity of the individual, maybe not so much in the Swedish system, but to the, related to the fact that a huge amount of transparency may tend to uh, undermine or reduce what you, you <coughs> described as the protection of the private individual, his or her integrity, in Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights. I will come back to that later on with an example, but I would like to just to finish by saying that the Swedish Constitution concerning its protection of fundamental rights corresponds to a huge extent with the European Convention of Human Rights, with one main exception, namely that Article 8 in the European Convention protecting the family, but also protecting the individual, his or her private sphere, does not have a real equivalent in the Swedish Constitution. And maybe we have already seen, and we could see more in the future, some tensions related to this. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. So we have a, a very interesting cross-cultural study, I think. I ha could I ask how many people in the US, in the audience are Americans? And how many of you would vote to have your personal tax data published? <laughs> Along with that of your neighbors, of course. <laughs> See? <laughs> I think if they did that to me, I'd have to move to the middle of Wyoming or something, you know. It's, <laughs> it's something that is considered so private in the US that uh, typically not even, not even your own uh, relatives or friends would, uh, would know. Um, and so it's a very different perspective. I, I think we're talking about various types of transparency, various types of uh, confidentiality here. So let's see if we can sort this out and tease it out a bit. Um, and uh, uh, Joachim, you've talked about transparency in public administration. I think that's something that the U.S. Uh, does compare favorably on, in part uh, in the tax area due to the efforts of our friends at tax analysts. Uh, to try to uh, to try to make sure that uh, that the system operates as transparently as possible, uh, people will always say there's room for improvement. But I think uh, uh, on an international scale, we're not we're not bad there. Um, transparency uh, about the taxation of particular taxpayers, uh, I think, very quickly collides with uh, with notions in many jurisdictions about privacy and confidentiality, the sort of thing that, uh, uh, that, uh, that Philip was just outlining. And the current initiatives uh, that Graham shared with us are really bringing that into very uh, sharp relief. 
Um, I was an IRS executive in charge of information exchange with other countries back in the olden days, not quite the 1990s, <laughs> although we were, we were still working on, on TIAs. And, uh, and uh, you know, I have to say, we, we read the words of the treaty, we, we, we thought about whether the information uh, that was being requested was necessary, that was the term of art used in the treaties of that generation. Uh, we looked at the other requirements of the treaty, that it not be information that the other country can't obtain under its own system, can't be information that the other country hasn't tried to obtain uh, already, made it, used its best efforts. There are a number of other restrictions in the treaties themselves. And these days you hear very little discussion about that. What's your take on that, Graham? Uh, so there's about three or four um um, issues uh, in what, what Carol just said. I mean, to, to, to my way of thinking, we, we kind of haven't got to the heart of what, what, is, what is it legitimate for the state to know about me uh, and when is it appropriate for that information to be disclosed to other people? And, and let me just put a couple of things um, uh, to flesh that out. First of all, I don't know that it's appropriate for the government of my country to tell the government uh, of... Uh, a, com a country where my main competitor resides, uh, information about my financial performance. Uh, there, I think, must be concerns, given the behaviour of some nations, that that information is going to be used to damage the commercial interests of, uh, of, of, uh, of a particular taxpayer. Secondly, I don't think there's any legitimate interest in giving information to governments who want to steal my property. Uh, if you uh, haven't read the UCOS determination, uh, I suggest you should read the UCOS determination. It is a salutary lesson in uh, the use of the tax system uh, in order to, uh, to achieve um, uh, inappropriate outcomes. I don't think it's appropriate for my government to be sharing information with other governments that might lead to what I would think of as disproportionate punishments. Uh, deprivation of liberty, maybe, I'm not sure death is the appropriate punishment for tax evasion. There are countries that put tax evaders to death. I don't think it makes sense for my government uh, to, um, to reveal information to governments that put people to death. I don't think that's a legitimate disclosure. I don't think it's a legitimate disclosure to reveal information to countries that persecute their political opponents uh, which, is, uh, which is perhaps a, a subset of, of one of the others. I don't think it's appropriate to be disclosing information to governments who can't be bothered getting off their backside and doing it for themselves. I don't think it's appropriate to be disclosing information to governments who are using exchange of information as the means to defeat domestic rules that hamstring uh, tax officials. And, and I, I really don't think it's appropriate to be... Uh, to be disclosing huge amounts of information in a world where we know that internal safeguards, internal constraints upon outsiders getting access to that information really can be easily undermined. Think of Mr Kyber, think of Mr Snowden, think of Mr Manning. Uh, those people with great ease were able to expropriate information, disseminate it widely, I don't think that's, uh, that's uh, an appropriate... Uh, I, I think that's a kind of serious matter that we need, we need to take into account in deciding what it is, when it is legitimate to be disclosing information. The current mood that everything must be made available automatically in a standard format to every other country on the world, I think, is misguided because of those kinds of dangers. Um, can I come back on a couple of points that I think partly arise from um, Graham and from Joachim's comments first? Um, Joachim, I think, is actually very interesting because I think what we're looking at is um, draw drawing a line between two principles that actually can sit quite well together, mm -hmm. but where the line can be drawn in different places by different countries. And sometimes that may give problems particularly in the light of Graham's last comments about exchanging information. Transparency, um, as you're looking at it, is primarily transparency of the government administration. So the ability to get 
um, documents from the governments about the deliberations of government committees. But with one or two exceptions, nearly every country I know that has freedom of information legislation excludes from that personal data of taxpayers. Um, so privacy, which is the other principle, um, is sit side by side by saying the information that you have to give to the tax authorities for your tax purposes, that is excluded from freedom of information. Um, and the two principles um, are observed um, uh, side by side. And I don't think there's any difficulty with that. Some countries will draw the line differently. You've mentioned that the Scandinavian countries have a long tradition of publishing the information about the final tax burden um, borne by individuals. And when we did the work for the EFA general report, had I mentioned that before? Um, no, I think. No, you may, you may, you may. Great. Um, uh, when we did the work on this and we looked at confidentiality, I knew that um, countries like Norway, Sweden, Finland published this information. And I thought, well, we're going to have difficulties here because we're going to have um, other countries having a principle of confidentiality, but none in the Scandinavians. No, what we found was that a country like Sweden publishes the final tax outcome, but the detailed information about how much the individual earned is preserved and protected by exactly the same form of secrecy. So there, there's a limited um, line to be drawn there. Um, incidentally, for Doug, who was talking earlier about journalists um, and their access, there's been a very interesting case from the European Court of Justice. The name is completely unpronounceable. It's a Finnish um, name um, there, um, where a Finnish um, magazine took the annually published data about the amount of tax paid by individuals and would produce a magazine based on that, commenting on it, exactly as you were saying, how much more somebody was earning for the, the one year than another. The Finnish Data Protection Agency banned that, saying that was breach of the right to privacy, went to the European Court, actually went both to the European Court in Strasbourg and to the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, on the question of whether this interfered with the rights of journalists, whether what was being done in the magazine was journalism. And the answer, I think, from a right from the European Court was, if it was genuine journalism, fine. But if it really was the sort of tittle-tattle, does that translate across the Atlantic, um, <laughs> there, the um, <laughs> then okay. that was not journalism. <laughs> and of course, Tax Notes International engage in the proper journalism, not no well. suggestion of tittle-tattle <laughs> um, there. Um, so just, um, yeah. it, it comes back a little bit to Graham's point about exchanging information, because there are some countries where the freedom of information legislation goes further and says, with regard to politicians, businessmen, persons in the public eye, the freedom of information legislation is not excluded from tax matters. And you can make a request in those countries for that information. The example that I know most clearly is India. And I do wonder how any country can exchange information given that the possibility that under freedom of information legislation, it could be accessed um, there. Last comment from me, and it goes back to the thing that Graham said right at the very beginning. He said that we're looking at maybe a sort of 19th century, I, I, paraphrasing it wrong, Graham, but um, 19th century concept of um, individual privacy with regard to tax matters. I was hoping that what I was saying about Europe was that that, not 19th century, but post Second World War idea is very strongly entrenched by the right to privacy and by the right of data protection. And there, we have a very tragic history in Europe of misuse of information, both before the Second World War and for those countries that are former parts of the, 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 the Soviet Union or under the Soviet bloc. And no one wants to see information misused in the same way the tax system was misused in UCOS um, there. So um, that's why we have such a strong starting point of protection of privacy, protection of data, uh, of data to which tax has to be a limited, proportionate exception in accordance with the law for specific purposes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so, uh, this is all very interesting, I think. Um,
I'm going to poll the audience again. How many of you, uh, uh, we've had a broad vote, I think, for, 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 for privacy of individual tax data. How many of you think that business tax data should be protected from public release? Ask it the other way. Ask it the other way. Oh, well, let's see. Uh, uh, how many of you think that all businesses should have their tax, uh, basic tax data anyway, released? Published. Published. Well, now, first I ask all businesses. Okay. Multinational businesses only? Public businesses only? All right, then I, I'm gonna ask the panel to comment on this. What, uh, what lessons do you uh, draw from this? And chime in as you like. Should, yeah. we, should we be drawing a distinction between individual and business taxpayers? What is the public interest exactly in, in publishing, uh, publishing uh, business tax data? Uh, okay, I can comment on that because first of all, I think there is a principal problem if you make distinctions between different taxpayers. And, and I was thinking when you mentioned this case mm -hmm. that I didn't know about in India, about the possibility to examine politicians' taxes, but not ours. Mm -hmm. I think that's totally wrong. And in, it's in the same way, I think, because there are countries in Europe who are very keen on prosecuting p newspapers and so on, who write about politicians when they have done something wrong. Uh, they have, may have been drunk when driving, or they may have problems with the tax authority or whatever. Uh, and and that, then they can go to directly to the court and say that this is liable and so on. I, I know about Austria and also Luxembourg where this has been a problem. And th those countries have been uh, sentenced immediately in the European Court of Human Rights for violating uh, freedom of speech. And I think it, it's basically a problem when you try to distinguish between different taxpayers. And basically I would say it's the same thing if you try to make one big distinction between individuals and companies because I think there is a, there may be a public interest if you if you think there is a public interest in knowing about private individuals and how much they pay and so on there is definitely a, a public interest in knowing about big businesses who normally make more money and if you also see it from the whole point of the let's say the economic point of view of society as a whole whether in in Sweden or in the United States I think it's it's interesting to know about big companies whether they actually contribute to uh, uh, the public wealth or whether they wish to reduce their tax uh, to a maximum. I mean, that it may be legitimate to do so, of course, and you may argue it for or against that, but if you, if you come to the conclusion that there is a public interest in revealing those matters, I think it's <laughs> equally interesting for, for companies. Now, Australia has just been through this debate. Graham, what do you take away from that? Um, well, I, I, I did want to say, just in response to Joachim, mm -hmm. Public interest in revealing that information, okay? Revealing it to whom? Mm -hmm. Revealing it to the tax authorities of the country where I operate? Revealing it to the tax authorities of a country where I don't operate? Or revealing it to people who buy evening newspapers? I can see a legitimate public interest in the first revelation. I'm a little skeptical about the second. I can see very little benefit in the third. Now I have to say, I grew up in the generation, I was there in the 90s, I still have the wardrobe. Um, <laughs> I grew up in the we, 70s, we all, we all which, is, which is even worse, but we, we won't go there. But, but, but I grew up in a world where Big Brother is watching, you meant something. Uh, so I don't face, and I don't link, and I don't tweet, and I don't Instagram, which makes me a dinosaur. I've got the hair to prove it. <laughs> but the, 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 the ethos today seems to be, hey, big brother, I'm over here, and here's my bank account number, and by the way, the PIN is 6842973. Um, I, to me, the, the tendency to beyond what I think of as the legitimate interest of the state in ascertaining the correct amount of taxable income to be collected from people who are either residents or who are undertaking activities in the, in the state is, is entirely appropriate. And while ever that information is held within the secrecy of the state, I don't have problems with greater levels of information being solicited by the state. What I do get concerned about is when we go beyond that. Now, my government has tried to grapple, as mm. you said, Carol, with this problem about if we're gonna tell the world uh, exactly what, uh, what people are doing, uh, to whom do we, on whom do we impose this obligation? So we started with uh, with um, uh, corporations, only corporates, which create a problem for other segments of the economy that don't operate through, through companies. Uh, 
corporations that uh, had a turnover of greater than 100 million Australian dollars, say about 70 million US. And now, we then discovered that there are several large privately held uh, groups which have interests in publicly traded things, and so we've just enacted, we just enacted an exception for private resident corporates who might have a turnover greater than 100 million uh, on the basis that we are now getting too close to legitimate private concerns about the humans who stand, who stand behind those matters. I should say the opposition in my country uh, tr has, has learned a little bit about uh, politics from watching too many episodes of House of Cards or something, <laughs> and has just, uh, <laughs> just decided to try to attach uh, the repeal of that carve-out for private companies. Uh, so they want to reinstate every company with a turnover mm -hmm. of uh, over 100 million. Mm -hmm. I, I think it will fail. It probably has failed while I was on the plane. But we have tried to draw that line. We've tried to say there's mm -hmm. big and there's small, there's private and there's public, and here's the combination we, right. we came up with. My question is always, what, what is the public going to do with this information? Yeah. I mean, uh, knowing how many cups of coffee a particular business sells in a particular country doesn't tell you whether they're paying the right amount of tax. <laughs> uh, yeah, Philip, but just, you've got just some uh, direct... Can I just uh, make one reflection? Uh, uh, okay, and yeah. then I want Philip to talk about Because I think it's, it's, there yeah. is a difficulty with this it's argument, although you have tried to distinguish in a way, but when you say it's not interesting for a person who buys the newspaper, but maybe that is the same person who considers buying a share in that company, and then, then any kind of information may, may be relevant. So I think, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's more like a principal discussion. Do you think certain I want that information to come from the company's publicly reliable documents. I don't want a world in which people are buying shares based on the disturbed meanderings of the confused minds of journalists. <laughs> <laughs> Person, company, except. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Philip. What, 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 do we, what does the UK experience with all of this tell us? Oh, I do know I could speak yeah. to the, the UK experience has been um, strange over the last couple of years with some of the um, disclosures um, there. But to, to answer your earlier question, um, uh, Carol, about what do we think uh, of disclosure of companies versus individuals, I mean, I have to, I suppose, approach it from a legalistic approach um, from the provisions on privacy, um, where I start with the assumption that all information provided to the government is private. Um, and that applies both to individuals and to companies. Companies also enjoy some human rights, um, and one of them is the right to, um, to privacy. Um, and I then say, well, that can be accepted only if it is in accordance with the law, necessary in a democratic society, for the economic well-being, and it's proportionate. Now, in accordance with the law means that the country concerned, its legislature must have decided that there should be exceptions, whether it's naming or shaming. And I think I start by respecting the decision of each country to put the line slightly differently. And some countries may say, um, yes, um, we think that it is appropriate to disclose information about large companies or about politicians. And I don't rule out that in some countries it may be very appropriate that if you are in public office, that's why I think I disagree with Joachim on this there, um, that if you're in public office, the amount of information that you're disclosing to the tax authorities, your, the income, should actually be public if the legislature decides that. It's not enough, though, that the legislature decides it. It has to be, in European terms, necessary in a democratic society. So there has to be a proper balance between the right to privacy of the individual or the company and the general public interest. I cannot see how it could ever be in the general public interest to know about my tax affairs or your tax affairs or the ordinary individual's tax affairs nor I would have thought can it ever be the case for a small you know, family-owned business that those should ever be disclosed. That is effectively an incorporation of the individual's activities. If a government, if a country decides that in the case of large multinationals the position is different and that there the balance favors disclosure, um, I can see that that may be a justifiable um, position. Um, again, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to make a prediction. I probably won't be around to check whether it's right or wrong, actually, but I would have said that within 
let's say, 20 years. I'll give myself until at least that long out there. Um, all large multinationals will need to append to their annual reporting um, a summary of their tax position in every country. The sort of CBC will have become um, public by that time. I think once we started gathering the information, and it will start to leak from certain countries, um, it will become a public requirement uh, there. So I don't rule out um, that in the case of particular individuals, such as politicians or large companies, the balance may favor disclosure as opposed to privacy. Right. Interesting. Um, I, I think it would be unfortunate if CBC reporting were, were the piece to become public because uh, the information doesn't have anything to do with the tax liability of companies under current law. And I guess I, my, per, my personal perspective uh, is, uh, is, is, to, uh, is to look very closely at the, at the current law. It's fair for, for tax administrations and for the population at large to expect taxpayers to meet their tax obligations under current law. Uh, I think the exchange of information under treaties is generally a good thing if conducted in accordance with the safeguards. Uh, that are in place under current law. Um, I, I start getting nervous when I see countries using, trying to use the exchange of information uh, provisions to gather information that doesn't pertain to their current law, uh, their current tax base that's not really permitted under the treaties, uh, but, to, but to somehow build public pressure for some change in the, in, in the tax laws. And change in the tax laws is the prerogative of, of countries. I don't have any, any problem with it, but, uh, but, but to somehow drag particular taxpayers through the mud, as it were, about not having paid enough tax uh, when, they, when their sales revenues, their, their, their gross turnover was, uh, was, was such and such in a particular country. Change um, in the tax laws in the United States might be an interesting yeah. concept to think about, wouldn't it? Yeah. Could, well, that we could dream on. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that, in, in my view, uh, go, goes a little, a step too far. <laughs> um, no, not the change in the U.S. tax laws. I, think I all, thought that's what you were saying. A lot, yeah. No, a lot of, a lot of tax professionals uh, in the U.S. would like to see some of the tax rules in the U.S. changed. Uh, certainly the, uh, the, the tax box. administration and the U.S. <laughs> Treasury have been behind that. Um, <laughs> but uh, maybe we need a parliamentary system. But, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, it, it, I do think uh, that, that the way in which um, at least the, 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 the tax treaty exchange of information is being conducted these days in a number of situations, that it's, it's really taken on a political purpose um, and governments are free to adopt their own policies. You know, they're sovereign. We hope, uh, 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 from a business perspective, that they coordinate and reach some sort of agreement because no business can pay double tax, um, uh, really, uh, to, to 193 or 94 countries and, and, uh, and still be in business. But, uh, but, uh, but, but the use of, uh, of, of tax information disclosure and exchange to, to, to further uh, policy goals, I think puts those instruments at risk uh, and, and will work to the detriment of tax administrations as courts around the world start looking at that more closely. Um, not, not necessarily in the interest of anyone in my view. Um, any f final remarks from the panel, Graham? Coffee starts in two minutes, and I can sense that the caffeine levels in the audience are falling dangerously low, so I'll pass, Carol. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I, just, I just wish to say in relation to transparency and, and so on, that, that uh, if you look at Swedish rules, of course, rules on transparency do not uh, apply in relation to private companies and so on. So in many mm -hmm. ways, private companies are exempted. Uh -huh. for, 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 for example, the protection for whistleblowers within mm -hmm. private companies does not exist, more or less. So, so I mean, there are already differences in the way that they are treated, but maybe yeah. I'm too much affected by, by Swedish legal education and so on, but to me it just sounds strange to somehow exempt certain companies and say that the, the, the facts of those companies or the facts of those mm -hmm. legal subjects should be made public, but not of those. It's, I mean, it goes contrary to the way I see that everyone should be huh. equally treated. I think the only thing I'd like to say is that it's a great pity we didn't have a chance to questions from um, 
the audience, but maybe we'll take the discussion into coffee with us and hopefully have a chance to chat amongst ourselves and with members of the audience outside. Okay, so thank you. Yeah.